The Recipe There is a story told by Sufis about a man who read that certain dervishes, on the orders of their master, never touched meat and did not smoke. Since this tends to fit in with certain well-established beliefs, especially in the West, this man made his way to the zawiya, or assembly place, of the illuminated ones, to sit at their feet. They were all over ninety years old. Sure enough, there they were, not a spot of nicotine or a shred of animal protein among them, and our hero gasped with delight as he sat drinking in the unpolluted air and tasting the bean curd soup which they provided. He hoped that he would at least live to a hundred. Suddenly one of them whispered, Here comes the great master, and all stood up as the venerable sage came in. He smiled benignly and went into the house, heading for his quarters. He did not look a day over fifty. How old is he, and what does he eat? asked the enraptured visitor. He is one hundred and fifty years old, and I don't suppose any of us will reach that venerable age and station, wheezed one of the ancients. But, of course, he is allowed twenty cigars and three steaks a day since he is now beyond being affected by frivolities and temptations. Hidebound attitudes towards the religious life, which have crystallised out as a result of certain processes and abstinences being carried out for limited periods and for specific studies being adopted as sacrosanct, have to be broken before progress in higher religious studies can take place. I am quite sure that many of the supposedly anti-clerical jokes found in the East and West have this very same important intent and function. They are not, that is to say, the work of scoffers, but of illuminates. Nowadays we even have stories told in the East which purport to be re-imports from the interplay of the cultures now happening in the West. The Background the first Eastern mystics were seen in America about 75 years ago, and there has been plenty of time for a whole undergrowth of tales about their adventures to grow up in their home countries. One such story concerns a prudent guru who did not want to waste too much time in cultivating people who were without sufficient prestige and collateral. He was introduced, it is said, to an American widow who was reputed to be very wealthy. Having learnt a thing or two about how things are done in the West, he asked an inquiry agency to check her out. When he opened the report, it said, She has a million dollars in the bank, but will probably not have it for long, as it is reported that an oriental phony is trying to get his hands on it. One of the characteristics of many truly metaphysical jokes, that is, tales and quips intended to jolt the consciousness, is that they are viable in several different ranges of meaning. As I have noted elsewhere, this is also one of the cultural requirements of a good story. In order to ensure the durability of a teaching tale, it must be one which will be preserved through retelling, even by people who have no idea of its inner values. Here is a story which may be taken as an anti-Sufi joke, while it also means that aversion therapy can only be done successfully by those who know how to do it. The School There was once a dervish who went to a certain country to set up a school. As the months passed, he found that there was another mystical master in the vicinity who had convinced people for miles around that mawkish sentimentality was the same as spirituality. So most of the people who came to sit at the feet of our dervish were influenced by this very same outlook. He realised that he had to get rid of them, so he went away for a pilgrimage, leaving behind a message. I have decided that the other dervish is so good, so pure and so holy, that I must go and ask you all, dear disciples, to follow him, for he is so much better a man than I am. When he came back, he found that the other dervish and all his disciples, having heard of this wonderful act of self-sacrifice and honesty, had come to join him. Unwitting humour is sometimes as good as anything intended to be funny. 
Many of the land of fools jokes are of this kind, and some of them emerge from interaction with people who think that they can think or feel or something else, when all that is happening is that they are inwardly pursuing some obsession or clamouring for attention. I quite often get this result when analysing people's reactions to books. People write to me constantly noting that I say that Sufism is not learnt from books. They don't ask me, never have so far, why I write books on this subject. They only ask how they can learn without books. People who think like that, asking someone who writes books how to learn without them, are unlikely to be able to learn in either manner. I generally put them in touch, if I have the time, with the smaller but still significant number who understand that literature is a. preparatory, b. capable of provoking experiences, c. able to interpret experiences, and d. likely to help people to avoid problems which would prevent them learning, and many more things besides. It is interesting to note that this automatic response, this half-understood reaction, is itself a sign that the books should be more carefully looked at before such a person can do any more. I must say, though, that the most amusing response of this kind that I have had was from a man who wrote, You have written so much about the confusing effects of reading the wrong literature, that which is written by muddled scholars and self-appointed masters, that I have decided to stop reading altogether. Some of the best jokes are unconsciously made. One can sometimes illustrate a psychological truth of value in religious studies by putting the idea into a profane framework. This is the instrumental or operative version of Sufi teaching, and is the higher level equivalent of the way in which religious preachers use worldly parallels to illustrate supposedly divine truths. The parable, defined by one schoolboy as a heavenly story with no earthly meaning. One such tale concerns the persistent claim that one should not charge for knowledge, even though everyone also knows that people do not value something which they have got for nothing. One of the major activities of Sufi teachers is to elicit a picture, a profile of the kind of mind, the pattern of conditioning and assumptions, which make up the intending disciple. One classical, if usually more concealed, instance is told in this joke. Belief The master was at the height of his harangue, and if I were to tell you anything of what I really deeply know, you would not believe me. If I were even to hint at the truths which are understood by those who have attained to truth, you would scoff. If I were to give you any statement of the amazing realities behind what you imagine to be reality, you would not credit it. A member of the audience held up his hand. Surely you cannot expect anyone to believe that. No service, no charge. A man went to a physician, feeling very much out of condition. Ah, yes, said the doctor. You must do this and not do that. You must eat this and drink that. And he droned on for a time. Presently, the patient started to walk out. You haven't paid for my advice, said the leech. Ah, but I am not taking it. It is very true that people don't value things that they get free. Equally, of course, for what it is worth, they won't pay for things if they don't intend to have them. A joke will sometimes help a disciple to see his real situation, though not always at the very moment when it is told. Anyone who has been any kind of teacher will know that certain pupils do not want to learn, but blame the teacher inwardly. Trying Harder A disciple had been attending the discourses of a certain teacher for some years without saying or doing anything. Finally, he called him in for a private talk. I have been giving you exercises and teachings for many years now, and I fail to descry any change in you, and I am becoming perturbed, he told him. I am glad that you have noticed at last, said the disciple. 
for I have personally felt for some months that you are not trying hard enough. As I have noted, jokes, which are familiar as just ordinary jests, can be seen to have psychological levels which can be quite striking when transposed into the spiritual situation. They have been used for centuries to hold a mirror up to people, so that they can see their own behaviour in a way which is otherwise very difficult indeed. Many quite unsuitable people try to attach themselves to teachers and teachings. Their unsuitability, more often than not, stems from the fact that they want to do or think exactly what they want to do or think, and they want to have all this approved as a mystic way. Just as good. One such person, a woman in this case, kept plaguing one teacher who, for something like twenty years, found it necessary to refuse to allow her to seek heaven through divining cards, enigmatic books, mysterious rituals, perfumes and disembodied voices. He did not allow her to use oriental names, to spiritualise the physical or to physicalise the spiritual. Finally, when she had become very subdued, he realised that she was only biding her time and would again start demanding secrets and processes instead of just teaching. He decided on a memorable once-for-all interview and counsel. Here, at last, are your instructions, he said. You will drink some holy water, fast for three months, and repeat this word ninety million times. Then you will walk to Kathmandu, measuring your length along the way, never lose your temper, strain every fibre to hear celestial music, and never say a metaphysical word. Then you will stop doing all these things and go back to ordinary life as you know it. Oh, master, she breathed, and I will then be in a state of perfect freedom and release? No, but you'll feel as if you were. Many people probably know this as a familiar doctor and patient joke, but note its relevance in the discipleship context. There is much unconscious humour to be met everywhere. I recently managed to get through to a circle of people who were posing, or rather their master was, as illuminated. The Secret I visited some self-styled Sufis who proved to be nothing other than, in their own eventual description of themselves, pious frauds. They claimed to have a secret teacher who knew everything, but whom one could not meet. This is one of the latest gambits, by the way. When he was run to ground by someone else, the following dialogue took place. Are you the secret teacher? Yes. But you don't know anything about Sufi teaching. That's right, but that is the secret. Those were people who did not know what they were doing. There is a tale about one who did know. It was the observers who did not. One of the most difficult things to teach is that Sufis may teach without the excitement and attention, without any of the externals that people desire and believe are part of higher teachings. In the Western world, for instance, there would probably be very little room for a silent Sufi. Yet there are, in fact, silent dervishes, as well as the whirling, dancing, howling and jumping ones but people are in many ways similar all over the world, and a tale is told of the silent dervish who came to settle in a village, where the people did everything they could to make him talk, so that they could get some teachings from him. They were unable to still their desire for stimulation by him, and as a result they were not able to perceive that he was continuously emanating baraka and teachings which they could otherwise have absorbed. One day, when he decided to move on, he thought that he would give them a hint of his function, because although he was a silent dervish, they wouldn't believe it. Last Straw People brought him food every day, and he always ate it. One day he had not, and when the people arrived with their offerings, he said, You can take this away. 
But why have you never spoken a word before? they clamoured. Well, the food has always been all right up to now. It has taken something like a hundred years of exposure to energetic missionary work from the East, notably India, for people in the West to realise something that a very large number of people in the East have known for a very long time. This is, of course, the fact that a lot of gurus do not know the simplest facts about human psychology, and even physiology. The next joke has been repeated for centuries, and startlingly well illustrates that contemporary knowledge of gurus by the populace was often greater than that of the gurus about the secular. What was needed? There were once two mystics talking. The first one said, I had a disciple once, and in spite of all my efforts I was unable to illuminate him. What did you do? asked the other. I made him repeat mantrams, gaze at symbols, dress in special garb, jump up and down, inhale incense, read invocations, and stand up in long vigils. Didn't he say anything which might give you a clue as to why all this was not giving him higher consciousness? Nothing. He just lay down and died. All he said was irrelevant. When am I going to get some food? People are always asking me why I have to rely to such an extent upon Middle Eastern knowledge of metaphysics and why I cannot disinter fragments of the Western tradition which will indicate the existence of a long-standing awareness of the levels of spiritual understanding. Here then is one instance which I take as showing that anyone who tries to graft spiritual practices – we are of course interested in higher perceptions – upon an unregenerate personality will end up with an aberration. I need not emphasise that there has recently been a period in which thousands, perhaps millions, of people in the West have tried to storm the gates of heaven by trying just that. This joke gets them into perspective if we realise that it is they who are the cannibals and not the African in the story. The people who think that they are religious, or equally, on a higher level of perception or mysticism, have in fact suppressed the real spiritual side and are living on a social, a shallow level. Ritual for its own sake A missionary who had been captured by cannibals was sitting in a cooking pot of rapidly heating water when he saw the cannibals with their hands clasped in prayer. He said to the nearest one, So you are devout Christians? Not only am I a Christian, replied the annoyed cannibal, but I strongly object to being interrupted while saying grace. The carrying on of automatic habits, of intellectual sophistries without a change in the person, or of emotional activities without deep perception acting upon the real self, cannot ever be the same as the experience of the mystic. If this tale is taken as a parable of trying to make someone rise to a higher state without transforming his lower aspects, it can also serve as a classical instance of the Sufi argument that human beings must clarify their personalities before they can attain certain desired levels. Let us call it the incompatibility of coexistent tendencies in the individual. I have noticed during the past 15 years or so that the ideas which we have put forth are increasingly being adopted as cultists adjust to the new knowledge. So let me give you a joke which should warn against adopting the cults which have clothed themselves in the Sufi raiment just because it is less tattered than their own. Sometimes, a man was saying, so many things have been borrowed by my neighbour, I feel more at home in his house than in my own. But the gurus who do this kind of imitating should beware. Something happened to one of them while trying to get some information on Sufi ways which he least expected. Incidentally, such developments are not uncommon in Sufi history, but I will go straight on to the true story. The Burden 
A man called at the house and asked if he could come in for a few minutes, as he owed me a great debt. I had the distinct impression that this was someone with no real metaphysical or traditional psychology interests, and I was sure that he was, as we sometimes, I am afraid, say, perceptively dead. I immediately asked him what this debt was. Your writings have released me from a great burden. I told him that I did not believe that he was at all improved by anything he had read. No, it is what has happened to my daughter. I said that I did not know his daughter, and that my writings were not designed to release people's daughters from great burdens. Would he tell me exactly what had happened? I realised it must be something on the mechanical plane of a sociological nature, not connected with anything deeper, I told him. Well, that figures, he answered. You see, my daughter was in the hands of a terrible guru who completely dominated her. He started to read your books and became so infuriated that he died of a heart attack. Now this is a real joke, in the sense that it not only happened, but it illustrates the different planes of understanding and misunderstanding, including the fact that when people, not this man, imagine that they are talking spiritually, they are only on the shallower, though certainly important, level of ordinary human life.